lecture more on the uh, forefoot injuries uh, and how you would take care of them. Uh, in this setting here, uh, we'll try to get the basics. If you have any questions at all, stop me and uh, we'll go from there. A lot of people um, said, you know, what about shoe gear? What should I wear? What shouldn't I wear? Uh, this will be mostly what you shouldn't wear. All right. These uh, new uh, heels you know, look very nice, but they can be very destructive. Um, a lot of the problems I'll talk about will be mentioned later on. This is what we call a pump bump. It's a bump on the back of the heel, and the pump can rub on that uh, protrusion, causing pain, swelling, irritation. The uh, pressure on the ball of the foot is called uh, metatarsalgia. And again, it's just from the unnatural position of the uh, foot on the ball. Uh, the lower two inch heels are, are better from the standpoint of balance and uh, taking some of those pressures off the foot and ankle. Again, when you have the stiletto type of heel, uh, it can be uh, at risk for an ankle sprain, and again, we'll get into the ankle sprains as well. There are thicker, what they call on the slides, chunky heels, which do offer a little bit more uh, support, balance, and in this instance would be better for you, but again, they still can have a lot of excess pressure on the forefoot. On the opposite side of the spectrum, the ballet flats, are also bad because they offer you no support whatsoever and they can act, aggravate uh, heel and arch pain. This gel type insole here uh, will give you pressure relief from a cushioning standpoint and, and then it also does have uh, a little bit of an arch to it to help support again the, the arch for the plantar fasciitis and the forefoot for the metatarsalgia. You wouldn't believe how many people come into the office with flip-flops. They say it's just so they can get the shoes off quickly so I can take care of them, but again, you know, that's a stylish type of uh, thing for the kids now. Uh, they wear them 11 out of the 12 months, and you're at risk for abrasions, uh, any type of uh, forefoot injury, kicking things. So there are some of these quote unquote flip flops that do offer a little bit of a, an arch type support and I'll show one later. Uh, soccer type of sandals that do help. I got three or four slides later but basically it's because if the arch is this size, okay, and there's a band going from the heel to the forefoot, and there's nothing supporting that, that band is constantly stretching, can tear, can strain, inflame, and just go downhill. So there's no support of that arch with a total flat like this. Actually, if you have plantar fasciitis, a low heel helps that. And we'll get into that later. Again, no support whatsoever. Here, I think you can see that there is an arch to it. There's a lot of cushion under the ball of the foot. And uh, this is a better alternative to a flip-flop. Okay. And this is not. Again, you're putting the heel uh, very high, putting a lot of excess pressure on the forefoot. More stable, may not cause the ankle sprain, but again, still a very unnatural position. The lower wedge uh, can still give you the look, the toning that you want, but uh, not as high and wobbly. Again, the stiletto pointed toe shoes, I call these bug killers. You can go into any corner and basically <laughs> kill the bugs if you need to, uh, but you're jamming a lot of uh, toes into a very tight area. You can get uh, neuromas, pinched nerves, Bunions, hammer toes, 
blisters. You can see the shape of the shoe and how the uh, forefoot is affected with all the jamming. In this instance, she has a bunion, which she'll say my bunion feels better with this open toe shoe, but it can aggravate a pre-existing condition. Hammer toes uh, will develop because you have a tendency to grip the, uh, the front part of the shoes. Uh, she actually has a, all four toes are hammered. She's starting to get corns on all the toes because of the constant contracture and that they may need surgery in the future. A more rounded toe box will take pressure off of those uh, forefoot deformities. Um, this is a uh, what they call performance pump. Uh, it does give the dress type shoe you know, without looking like an old lady librarian shoe. Uh, again, proper fit. This one has uh, fallen off the side. She's probably going to get blisters. She's going to get uh, very dry, cracked heels. Uh, again, at risk for ankle sprains, uh, numerous problems. You've seen these in the past. They still do use them. They're called Brannock devices. You know, they are helpful getting the proper width. Um, most shoes do run. Uh, more narrow than they ever have in the past. Um, I consider myself an average width foot, but I wear New Balance 4Es just because that's what feels comfortable. So, whereas you may think you always were a 10 and a half D, you're probably not any more more because of how the shoes are constructed now than that your foot has gone wide. How? How many shoe size changes have you changed in the last 20 years with your running? Uh, yeah. So you're not in the same sea that you used to be a long time ago. I think they're making them shorter. They, they, a lot of them are manufactured in China. They're not going up a size. The shoe lasts. The, the form that they made used to make before it was always very general you know and now they keep getting more narrow more pointed so even the men are getting into the pointed toe shoes for style and giving them the same problems as women this is called a minimalist shoe it was all the rage for a period of time now they're getting sued so don't buy these uh, the toners the rocker bottom shoes uh, have shown some uh, good results with uh, heel and arch pain, uh, but again, it's not for everybody. It can have some balance issues, uh, especially with the uh, uh, the older patients. Sir, it, it's stretching the toes. You know, it, it's not a natural position for the toes to be in. Um, I, I think what they were trying to get at that. Some people can run barefoot and do well. So if they run with this, they're preventing some of the uh, trauma from roads and whatnot, giving it a little bit of support. But again, to have the toe spread like that, because there are individual slots for every toe, you know, it strains the tendons, ligaments, so that there are people now that are suing this company. Again, most women won't wear these shoes, but if you can find something that's a little bit lower, a little bit wider, a little bit softer, uh, with uh, some bend in the, uh, the forefoot, again, as long as it's not a very thin stiletto, uh, high spike, should do fine. Again, this goes from youth to adults, football, basketball, soccer, there's more kids in the world playing soccer in the United States under 16, but over 16, we have the fewest amount of kids playing soccer. So a lot of exercise, a lot of risk for injuries. Um, 
good exercise, but again, they, too many kids are trying to specialize in just one sport, and I think we're causing more problems for those kids and not allowing all the muscles to develop. Track, volleyball. Again, you get either a traumatic, twisting, falling type of injury or overuse just from doing too much too often. Blister, uh, very simple problem, shoe wear, uh, improper fit, uh, thin sock, uh, some moisture in the socks. Uh, every doctor you see will say, do not break this blister. I'm telling you, break this blister. You want to drain this to relieve the pain. So again, needle, scissors, right here, all this drains out, pain goes away. Clean it with soap water, do not take that lid off because that's a protective seal like a Band-Aid. Put some uh, soap water, antibiotic ointment, iodine, Band-Aid, that'll heal on eventually and you won't have the pain because sooner or later if you don't break it, shoes or something will break it and it'll be more uncomfortable. So I have patients break these if, if the Friday at four o'clock. Same thing on the toe, relieve that pressure, you'll be better a lot sooner. Some people use moleskin tape, anything just to prevent that friction rubbing on the uh, sore spot. But again, it goes back to an issue where your shoes may have been too loose, too tight, uh, moisture, socks not fitting well, you know, so spend the extra couple minutes, you know, getting a good fitting shoe and don't get the cheapest socks all the time. Runner's toe, uh, when you're running, there's a lot of fore, uh, pressure on the forefoot uh, of the toe hitting the top of the shoe box. And you get some bleeding underneath of the toenail. The uh, problem is usually self-limiting. It usually goes away in time, but it can be painful if there's a lot of fluid buildup underneath there. In this instance, instead of a downward pressure on the nail causing the bleeding, this is a uh, pressure from the front to the back jamming the nail. Same thing, you get that fluid buildup. Don't always do this, but if you can relieve the pressure, it'll heal faster. Most likely, if there's enough fluid buildup, you will lose this nail in time it will be pushed off by a new nail, but it's a year-long process to go from the front to the back. Ingrown toenails. This was not caused by somebody trimming their nails wrong. This was most likely a trauma to the toe somewhere in the past to change the structure <laughs> of the toenail. So instead of coming out flat, it comes out with that hook if that hook breaks the skin, you'll get you know, changes to the soft tissue, most likely a soft tissue infection. You can soak this, put an antibiotic ointment on it, wear an open toe shoe, use an oral antibiotic. If you don't take the thorn out of the paw, it's not gonna get any better. Normally we have to take a piece of nail, put some medicine down the side, now you have a straight edge, problem's gone. Turf toe uh, usually is a traumatic type of injury, especially with uh, football players. Uh, some of these Pittsburgh slides weren't supposed to be in there, but I'm a Pittsburgh fan. And Jack Lambert actually retired because of turf toe. It's a tear in the soft tissue capsule underneath of the big toe. And if that doesn't scar back, you can't push off, you're done. So they have different types of dislocations that can cause you know, serious pain problems, but even just the a little tear in the uh, bottom of the toe joint can be very painful. They have these different mole skin and tapings to try to uh, stabilize the toe, help allow that to re-scar, but you're talking months, sometimes uh, a year. 
there are two little bones underneath of the big toe. The tendon going to those two little bones glide with the toe moving up and down, sometimes with excessive force, sometimes with just the wrong shoe gear coming down hard. You can get a little crack in one of those little bones. That's smaller than a pencil eraser tip, but will disable you for months. Using a cutout where it allows that area to uh, be a little bit lower than the rest of the foot sometimes offloads the problem and can help get rid of some of the pain. Morton's neuroma is a pinched nerve, usually between the second and third or third and fourth toes. This is a classic picture where you'll rub your foot because you get this numb, tingling, burning, shooting type of pain into your toes. Diabetics can get what is called neuropathy, and that's usually the same type of symptoms, but all the toes, both feet. If you say a second or my third toe just feels numb, like there's a sock balled up, it just feels wrong, normally it's a pinched nerve. Ice, anti-inflammatories, proper shoe gears help. Normally you have to get a shot to help settle that nerve down, shrink the nerve, get some of that swelling out of the sheath or covering of the nerve to get rid of that pain. <coughs> Toe fractures, uh, everybody's kicked the, a bed post or a wall or a door or anything. In this instance, the fourth and fifth toes are probably splayed out and it just caused that fracture. In this instance, since it's not in the joint, since it's in fairly good position, uh, normally all you need to do is an open toe shoe, some buddy taping of toes four or five, ice anti-inflammatories elevation. A little chip fracture here, again, you're not going to want to do anything other than just protect that, stabilize it. That needs attention because that, that won't fix itself unless you recreate the injury, which is hard. So for that, you would actually have to numb up the toe, pull the toe to 2 o'clock, and then bring it back over to 12 and tape it and hope that you didn't break it in half. Measure simple buddy taping. Normally I tell patients, uh, an open toe shoe for a couple weeks until the swelling and pain goes down, but six weeks for buddy taping, especially if there's a fracture associated with it. That gives the fracture time to fill in, get some bone cement, bone paste in there, put it in the proper frame of mind. There's, there's millions of people doing it every day. So with the proper shoes, proper training, how many have you done? He, he seems to be in good health for 20 marathons, 40 half marathons, which is the 13. If I tell you one way, you'll go out and trip and fall. So yeah, there's, there's a million people running with a million different gates. You're going to see half the people out there that look like they're going to die, and they'll beat you to the finish line. So you, normally I would say heel toe, okay? But there's people that run up there on their toes for 26 miles. So the, it's like a golf swing. You can't teach you know, a proper stride, length, strike, you know, without having your own little influence in it. Yeah. 
if, if you have flat feet, you'll never be able to be a toe strider. If you have high arch, a toe strider is easier. So again, it, it's foot mechanics more than style. Not as much as the toes, but the metatarsal heads. Yeah, because you're, you're doing this every time. The plantar fascia goes from the heel up to the forefoot. It's a cord of tissue similar to the Achilles, but it's not coming from a muscle. It's its own separate fibrous grouping. If you have tenderness in the midfoot, normally we'll call it just plantar fasciitis. Now you can get a heel spur associated with the plantar fasciitis, and you'll call it a heel spur syndrome. Either way, it's tightness of that band of fibers, inflammation, pain. First step out of bed, getting up from the couch, the dinner table, the car, the sharp shooting, burning, aching type of pain. Five minutes later, it's a little bit better. If you stand all day in one position, you'll be worse off than her that's walking around the same facility all day because it's just that band being overstretched continually as opposed to you know, heel toe, it's a more natural type of stretch. You can have plantar fasciitis without a heel spur. You'll never have, plan never have a heel spur without plantar fasciitis. A lot of people come in with heel pain. Don't always get x-rays, but sometimes they come with them. And they'll have a spur about this big. Doesn't change the treatment. That just tells me that you've had heel and arch pain for years for it to show up on x-ray. But you could have pain tomorrow, same arch type of pain, and not have a heel spur. So you're not treating the heel spur, you're treating the inflammation of the fascia. It's not necessarily one-to-one, -one, but people that do have plantar fasciitis usually do have a tight heel cord. So when we show them the uh, stretches, we'll show them one that kind of isolates the plantar fascia, but also do the wall stretch for the gastro. So again, you can have a heel spur with your plantar fasciitis or not. It's called the low die taping, 100 years old. There's 100 different insoles at Walmart that will do a better job than this taping will. These are custom made art supports, which again, if you have the money, great, but with insurance companies now, it's, it's almost unfeasible to, to pay you know, the three, four, five hundred dollars they want for these devices on a regular basis as a first line of treatment. So I have patients stretch, ice, make sure they have a good supportive proper shoe, even a five dollar over the counter Dr. Scholl, something that fills that arch space in your shoe, anti-inflammatories. They have these new compound gels that are being marketed now. Imagine Icy Hot in a ball with some Novocaine, with some Motrin, with some muscle relaxant, with some other type of things that will penetrate in through the heel and the arch, work on that inflammation without you chewing up your stomach, eating oral anti-inflammatories. Capsaicin, you know, red hot chili pepper is over the counter but that's more just for this topical surface area. There's a Voltaren gel, which is a prescription, which is anti-inflammatory, but doesn't have the Novocaine, the, the other meds that work better. Ma'am? Short term, I'd rather both. When you come into my office, I'm going to give you 
instructions for ice, stretching, proper shoes, oral, topical, or support. If you say your pain is 10 out of 10, it's been that way for weeks, I'm going to give you a shot. That's seven different modalities. A lot of people will go somewhere and say, stretch and you know, get some insoles. Have a pill and stretch. Change your shoes and get a little art support. I'd rather give you all seven at the same time and try to get you better faster. If I give you a shot, I'm going to have you back in two weeks, not a month. I want you to get better faster. So, What dose are you talking, over the counter? How many times? That's, that's a little rough on your stomach, but that's better than, I have patients come in taking 200 Advil twice a day. I said, that's not even a third of an adult dose. So the problem with over-the-counter medications, Bayer, whoever, is going to give you the lowest dose, not even the proper dose to save their collective butts in case you try to treat yourself. Aleve, you should be taking two twice a day. That, that's 880 milligrams. Naproxen, the prescription strength, is 1,000. Ibuprofen is 200. They'll tell you to take two, which is 400, twice a day, which is 800. That's only a third of an adult dose. So I would rather use the proper amount for a short period of time as opposed to taking 200 and say, well, that didn't work. And again, it's a multifaceted treatment plan. Pump bump goes back to that picture we had before with the uh, uh, dress type shoes. This is a bony protrusion on the back of the heel. It either is from the bone itself being deformed or sometimes you can get some calcification along the Achilles tendon that causes that pressure too. You want to try to avoid surgery if you can because to do the surgery you have to move the Achilles tendon. If you're moving the Achilles tendon you're weakening it and if you're weakening the Achilles tendon you're in a cast for three months. So if you have this you try to go to something backless, you try to take the pressure off of it but if you need it it is correctable but again at a cost. Severe's disease is a heel pain problem, usually uh, a young, active uh, child. There's this excessive uh, pressure on the back of the heel. This is the growth plate of a uh, young adult. It's not totally fused because he's still growing. But if the Achilles tendon is going into the back of that heel bone, it's pulling on that, causing more inflammation. So again, the Achilles tendon is probably tight. They're, they're uh, not stretching properly. They're running around. Uh, sometime you'll find it in a, a heavier child, and you need the same type of thing, ice, anti-inflammatories. If you feel it's uh, that bad, I would probably just go with a 200 you know, with a child. But normally, they need an orthotic and some rest. A heel cup kind of protects that. Uh, uh, growth plate, along with the rest in the ice. Can you see where that problem is? It's on the second long bone. There's a little shadow. That's an incomplete break of a bone. It's called a stress fracture. If you have foot pain today and you get an x-ray, Normally, you will not see any physical changes. You have swelling, you have pain, can't wear shoes, it's very uncomfortable. Two weeks later, this shows up. It's like a crack in an egg where you see the physical crack in the bone, but there's no yolk coming out. So there's a shell around bone, periosteum, that can be injured that will cause a stress fracture. Still as painful as a regular fracture, but you won't see any physical findings for 10, 14, set 21 days. Bone scan, we'll see it day one if you can get the approval for it. This is what we call a post-op shoe. It's a wooden sole shoe. It doesn't allow motion of that bone and helps it heal faster. A lot of times you can get these at pharmacies. 
if you had to spend twenty dollars on a shoe to keep for the rest of your life, that's right there. Drop something, kick something, get stepped on, swelling, problems. This is your go-to. It's a middle last. It's not a right or a left. So throw it in the back of your closet. Don't don't ever throw it away. This is what we're talking about, that mid-foot injury. Uh, very traumatic. Usually it's a uh, sports type injury. Uh, the foot plants and you keep going. So just like the ACL tears up the knee, this tears up the midfoot. If you look at that dead space here, this is where it's supposed to be. All this is shifted off of the foot. Um, if it's subtle, sometimes it's missed and you keep walking on and people say, oh, it's just a sprain, it's just some arthritis, it's just a nothing. And again, it continues to break down and you now are looking at screws and plates and months of pain. Everybody's had an ankle sprain. It's a twisting uh, type of motion where the outside ligaments on the ankle are very, very weak. Uh, you know, people, people can move their foot right now on the outside, and some, some people can put it on the floor because they've had so many ankle sprains in the past. These are rubber bands that will stretch and stretch and stretch, and then finally they'll just break. You can, you can recover from an ankle sprain, but your ligaments are never as strong as they were before. It would be like sewing two rubber bands together. The rubber band is back together, but now where you sewed it, it's weak on each side of the sewing. And whatever force it took to get the sprain in the first place, it takes less strain to do the same thing over. That's why if you watch a professional basketball game, you see 10 people out there and 20 ankle braces because they're so at risk to roll it over, so they're more preventative. So if you ever do have an ankle sprain, you go to the emergency room, they take an x-ray, it says nothing fractured, go home. I would see somebody to at least get an ankle brace, uh, I'll go back to this. An ankle brace at a minimum. This is called a air cast stirrup, fiberglass, which don't necessarily need, and now these walking boots. Over treat this now, and a year from now you'll be a lot happier. Because if you don't, again, you'll be chasing this for the rest of your life. You've heard of RICE, rest, ice, compression, elevation. The P is for the protection. And that's where you get into the bracing, proper shoes, and whatnot. You can use that for almost anything. People say they're elevating their feet if they're an inch off the ground. It's got to be level with the heart if you really want to get that swelling out of there. The foot's up, it's wrapped. Uh, put ice on the outside part of the, the foot and ankle for the inflammation, Advil or leave. Don't necessarily need non-weight bearing, but again, the first couple days, the more you keep that swelling down, the better you'll feel later. Cheap old ACE wrap will work if you do it the right way. On the left of the slide, if you start your ACE wrap on the top of your foot and go towards the big toe. This is not going to be easy. What you want to do is bring the foot in. Because if you have the, the strap on the top and you go towards the little toe, you're recreating the injury. So you want to bring your foot up and in as opposed to down and out. So a couple times around the foot, figure eight, bring it up, you're good problem with this compared to that is are you putting the same amount of stretch, compression, uh, pull on that as you would 
lacing this up. This is going to be more dynamic and helpful. Probably would wear this for a couple weeks, all day, every day. Again, with the ice and the compression, blah, blah, blah. For sports, for cleaning, for yard work, whatnot, I would wear this for three months. Again, overprotected now, be happier later. After everything's healed and you're feeling better, when you return to exercise, yes, I would wear that. Even if you just threw it in your gym bag that I'm going to go exercise, I'm wearing this to protect myself for that three months. I'm going to go out and do yard work. I would do that, boots, something to protect the ankle. Again, this is the ultimate ice machine. Achilles tendonitis, tendinosis. There's a lot of different names. On the right of the slide is your Achilles tendon, and it actually is inside of a little tube. On the left, the Achilles tendon hasn't swollen. It's the tube that has swollen. If I would have been here last night, I could have shown you mine. Because every once in a while, it just bubbles up. So you have to treat the swelling with ice, anti-inflammatories, some gentle range of motion because if you're too aggressive with this, you could actually tear the Achilles. So again, the classic wall type stretch, make sure that the back heel is on the ground. And you should be able to get, you can see that's a 10, 15 degree angle. That's a, that's a very good stretch. Knee locked, heel on the ground. Worst case scenario, piece on the left is intact Achilles tendon. The shredded part is the top part going up the leg. Very difficult to get that shred back together. They make it look easy here. Hmm? Is that repair or is that repair? Repair. Now a lot of times what they're doing is putting a graft jacket or something on top of this to again give it that additional strength. Um, that was probably a minor one. I've seen it where they actually have to go further up and flap down. And I saw a guy fixing one for three hours with somebody outside banging on the door. Hey, my time. I've got to get in there. Shin splints, again, a running type of injury, front part of your leg, um, <clears throat> hard surfaces, improper stride, not a good warm up. Um, I was in the Air Force for 14 years, and every new recruit that was used to wearing tennis shoes all through grade school, high school, coming in, now we gave them some boots, some Corifram plastic shiny shoes, marching on concrete. I need a waiver. I can't run. I can't, can't chew gum. Don't make me run. It's the muscle on the front part of the leg. This is basically the only thing that really works. You know, an isometric type of uh, stretch. You know, the recruits would have desks in their room. I would have them sit on top of the desk, get something that actually stretches the foot down and up just to help stretch out that muscle. Again, custom arch supports come in all shapes, sizes. The one on the far left is advertised as a woman's orthotic. If you have anything more than a one inch heel, you've already taken a lot of the benefits of the arch type support out of play. And that does help to fill it, but I think you can see where there isn't that hard plastic supporting the bridge of the arch. So uh, I wouldn't spend $400 on a woman's heel orthotic or pump orthotic. Yes? That's, that's usually the main muscle that gets the shin splint. Is tightness because it, it grabs on you. 
Yes. Well, you're trying to do it in a controlled situation. Okay, you're trying to stretch that back out because normally it goes into a spasm. Everybody has their favorite shoe. The one on the right is heel vertical. I think you can see the one on the left is canted towards the inside. You may turn over that shoe and you may have a full clean tread and say, these shoes are too good to throw away. But you've blown through the rear counter, so that's where even an over-the-counter device will help to support you rolling over and going through that rear counter. I think you can see the one on the right, it's more of a harder plastic and it's probably preventing that. Um, give me a shoe. When you get your shoe, squeeze here, okay? If it's, if it's rigid, it's not going to have the tendency to break down. If you squeeze it and it does this, put it back on the shelf and look again. Okay? I don't care what brand you get. I don't care what color you get. I don't care if you get mesh as opposed to leather. It's all your comfort, but you want a sturdy rear counter. It's all your support comes from the rear foot forward. Thank you, sir. This is what usually will cause that rear foot counter to break down quicker. There is already a uh, heel bone that's rolling in, probably has a severe flat foot deformity. This device, custom made, will bring it more towards neutral. Questions? Ma'am? Probably to both, okay, but um, spending the $45 or whatever copay amount is to see a pediatric orthopedic probably wouldn't be a bad idea. I mean, you could show her some of those stretching type exercises. Uh, a lot of times you could just make it a game, you know, just stretching them to neutral because if they, if they can't even get to neutral, they're always going to be that type of gait. With time, maybe it will stretch out and those kids will tell their kids, oh, yeah, it's fine, no problem. But there is that occasion where you actually have to go in and do an Achilles tendon lengthening. You know, and you know, do you want to put those kids through any kind of suffering? A lot of different devices in the past. Um, a lot of kids will outgrow that, all right? Um, wow. Right. Do you know, you know what the big, you know what a big wheel is? Is he too big for a big wheel? Kind of, sort of? Okay. Big wheels, skating, force the feet out. So that's, a, that's something that you can do, especially... Not necessarily. There are devices that you can make. So, yes. Yeah, I mean, because not all these devices work. If you look at the regular device, it's rounded off, okay? These will be kind of slanted off of the side, making the toes work a little bit harder and work it out. If you go in a big wheel, you have to put your feet out to go with the, the bike. If you want to skate, you have to turn your feet out to skate, roller skating, ice skating, whatever. So it's kind of forcing those muscles to work a little bit harder, a little bit quicker. Whenever you can afford it, okay? I mean, in a, in a different time, they had 
uh, shoe repair where you could actually put a new heel on and it wouldn't cost more than getting a brand new pair of shoes. Um, everybody has a tendency to walk on the outside part of the heel, go forward, and then push off. If you spend a little bit more time out there, that's where you'll grind down that heel. So when you get a new shoe, they do have those little tape on, hammer on, little heel savers, which will help a little bit. But uh, again, the shoe, shoes are just poorly constructed now. They don't have the good heavy heel that you need to help stop that breakdown. You can get uh, some overuse type of things with the back of the, the heel and the ankle. You can put pressure on your ankle. You can turn your ankle over. So, you know, it, it's better to have the foot in that up and down position rather than rolled out or rolled in. Because a lot of times when you see that rolled in, it can also be because you're, you're going out like this and then you have to come back in. So if there's that rotation, you can get excess wear on the outside part of the heel and then rolling in. So the more stable that rear foot is, the better. Yes, and most people do pronate, so that's why you'll get running shoes that are uh, geared towards the over pronator. Very few people supinate. So, yeah, more people pronate, so that's why you want that rear foot just a little bit more canted. That was supposed to be hidden. <laughs> but in this instance where this crowd... Um, that's a very severe athlete's foot infection. So if you go back towards the front after the shoes, they showed a lot of blistering underneath of the toes. That's a, uh, a severe athlete's foot infection. Uh, normally you're gonna need an oral type of uh, antifungal to control that because it has gone so bad. Uh, Epsom salt soaks, topical anti-inflammatory, make sure that you have um, clean, dry shoes every day. If you wore those shoes 18 hours today, 90 degrees outside, they're not going to be dry tomorrow morning. So if you can bypass that pair of shoes, if you can change your socks when you get home, that kind of thing will help prevent that severe uh, type of problem. But that, that got away from somebody and kept propagating it. The uh, the picture with the nail, a lot of times it is just from a little bit of bleeding under the toenail. But if you don't remember any kind of trauma and it just looks wrong, one in a thousand times it can be a tumor. So if it has a more uniform look, if it uh, doesn't have any history of trauma, you may want to have that looked at. I had a 25-year-old that I could look at that nail. My nurse could look at the nail. Tanya could look at that nail and say, that's a bruise. He was on the internet. He was sure that was a tumor. So I numbed him up, took his nail off, and the discoloration came off with the toenail. Okay. But mentally, he felt better. So the opposite is that if you have you know, a, a dark spot in the middle that doesn't look like it's moving out in time, because with these hematomas, blood underneath the nail, it'll grow out in time. If it's staying there, there's a problem. It could save your life. But I think you can see how moist that looks. Yeah, so that, that's more of the tinea. And a lot of times, you know, 10 days of the oral lamisil, as much as you've heard all the bad stuff about lamisil for 90 days on your liver, 10, 14 days will clear that up and probably never have a problem again. Sir? You drop something, you kick something, you got a tight pair of shoes. 
Well, it, if, if you don't recall any trauma, okay, but it has that classic appearance where it, it's kind of all over the nail or off to one side, and a month later you see a clear area back by the cuticle. That means the nail's growing out with it, okay? But if you kind of mentally draw a circle around it and it's not moving, Again, more, more rare without some sort of tight shoe something. Yes. Ma'am. You said neurology, and then years later, cancer, and then again, can you see the cancer? Again, is it just those two toes where the neuroma was done, or all of them? Well, mostly where the surgery was. Okay, so where the surgery was, you were meant to have numbness because they took the nerve out, okay? So once they take the nerve out, I can't give that back. Sometimes you can have neuroma surgery and have the pain return because there's actually been some regrowth off of that stump where they took the nerve, okay? So that's actually worse where you had the numb, tingly, burning, uncontrollable, you took the nerve out, and then a year later, and you're starting to get that shooting pain back. So either there was another little feeder nerve or that nerve kind of sent some little feeders out and has recurred. Then it, you could, you, I've, I've done surgery where I've taken out two neuromas at the same time from two, three, and three, four. So you can take it out two, three, and if you have it in three, four, it's probably a new nerve. Ma'am. It, it's, it's a physical deformity of the toe, pressure from the shoe. And then you'll get a blister. As the blister continues, you'll get the corn. Now, sometimes you can get a deformity, and there's pressure there, but you don't necessarily get the physical hardening of the tissue. But you still have that prominence of the bone. You can't, you can't put a Dr. Scholl corn plaster on that and do anything but damage. So if you have a physical hardening of skin, the corn plaster for a little bit of time will help to get rid of some of that, but you're not changing the structure of the toe. So I wouldn't use the corn plaster more than a very short period of time, if at all. They have what is called silicone toe shields. It looks like a little sleeve that pulls over the toe. On the inside of it is a gel that will cushion the bone from the shoe. And again, it's very, very safe. You can spend seven dollars for it and it'll last you for months, if not a year. You will always see them in, you know, certain St. Leonard's magazines, that kind of thing. Um, there's a Hawks Medical Supply in Vandalia that has them. Uh, there's a place down in Centerville called Foot Focus. Also, uh, if you go and put toe sleeve you know, in the computer, you'll get a thousand hits and it depends on how much you want to spend for shipping and handling. Oh, sure. But again, you can't just remove the corn. You have to re do something to the bone to make sure that the corn never comes back. So it's a bone surgery. It's not patients come in and say, cut my corn off. I trim it down. It looks good. And they say, well, it came back. I said, because I didn't do anything to the bone. So if, if you're looking at a permanent fix, it's bone surgery. If it's temporary where I just want that relief for two, three months, you know, we can trim that but then the sleeve will help. What about the points underneath the foot and the end of the toe? That's where the gel type insoles will help to release some of that pressure. Um, if, if you're walking on bone and you get a callus there, anything you can do to relieve some of that pressure on 
that callus. If it's real focused, uh, sometimes I will just cut that out, put a couple stitches in there, and we're done. But if it's a callus, you need to do something to stop change in mechanics. Tanya's tired and wants to go home, so if there's no more questions. Okay, night.